Aikins, third generation skydiver, wingsuit flyer, pilot, and the guy who jumped out of a plane at 25,000 feet without a parachute. Welcome to Air Sports News. How you doing? I'm good. It's good to catch up with you, my friend. You're in quarantine right now, are you? Uh, not really. We just finally broke. It's been three months. This is the first jump trip in three months. So I'm down here in Arizona. I got Mike Swanson and Jeff Provenzano. We're down here having some fun in Arizona. So you, you do a lot of work with Red Bull, a lot of demo, a lot of exhibition stuff. Tell me a little bit about that. So it's really cool, man. Like when I was a kid, there was the Budweiser skydive team and then the Coors had a skydiving team. And I remember that when I was a little kid and somehow I was able to work my way into this Red Bull gig. And so I'm on, in my opinion, the coolest sponsor in the world um, that lets me travel around and do cool events. And I mean, I, I was just thinking about it. Jeff Thoreau and I were talking and we used to all share hotel rooms, you know, bunking up three or four dudes to a room to be able to do the stuff that we get to go do now. And we would stress over who was going to win the competition and all that. And now we go stay in fancy hotels and get to uh, skydive for fun, demonstrations wise. Guys, you guys deserve it. You got Amy as well, who's in the team. Yeah, you, yeah you. I got Amy and then my cousin Andy Farrington, yeah. he uh, lives right next to me. We have 40 acres between the two of us, we have a little grass strip. So during this quarantine, we were fortunate enough that like, we could jump every day. Um, I would fly, Andy would jump, Andy would fly, I would jump. Um, I did a funny little video where I did a Red Bull demo for my son and Andy's kids and I signed a hero card for him just being funny, you know, I did a I demo into the backyard. One of the funniest ones I saw was uh, taking your bike in the plane. You went for pizza. <laughs> yeah, I went and got Chinese food at the, Chinese the airplane food. to get Chinese food. Got on the bike, rode, put it in the cool in the cooler, which kept it warm, and then flew it back to the house in the plane. Pretty funny. Yeah. I love it. I always watch the video, seeing you landing there on that strip with your family out waiting for you. Well, listen, let's talk a little bit about this jump. That's what a lot of people want to know about air sports news. People from lots of different air sports are tuning in for this. An incredible feat. It was an incredible experience. Whenever I watch it, I've just watched it again now a few minutes ago, and I've watched it multiple times. I'll be honest with you, it gives me a sensation and a rush and a palm sweat more than any skydive I've done in 30 years. Your jump, peaks me out more than any jump I've done. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because I've heard that from many people. Like, I, I travel around and I do talks, big presentations from lawyer groups to dentists, you know, all that stuff. And whether it's risk management or team building, you know, that kind of stuff I talk about. But when I talk to skydivers about it, they know what it's like, right? People in aviation understand that when I stepped out, there was no harness, there was no parachute. I mean, Rook tells a funny story to me that he was sitting on his couch, Rook Nelson, when I when we exited. He was sitting on his couch. About halfway down, he's standing up. Right before I go, he's pacing back and forth in his <laughs> living room, you know, because it, it was so real. And um, I'm so stoked that it was accepted so well by my peers, you know. I, I don't, not that I don't care about the rest of the world, but to me, it's really important that this wasn't just this crazy gag, flip of a coin type of stunt. This was a, a true flight test program that, I was able to take all the stuff and all the people that I know and was able to mitigate the risk down to what I felt was acceptable. Um, and we did it with all the permissions that you can get, FAA, USPA. I mean, USPA had nothing to do with the actual day of the jump, but they gave me a waiver to open super low to practice, to train for this jump so I could train for it safely and not break the rules. Yeah, you, you did over 50 jumps, opening at 500 feet above the net. Yeah, so my wife and I had a deal that by the time we did it for real, I needed to do 75 jumps in a row, opening a thousand feet or below, right over the center of the net, verified with the GPS, the cameras, all of that stuff. By the time we did it for real, the last jump was my 82nd jump in a row. Um, and that, are, was funny enough, was the one I was the most off the center, was the one I did for real. Um, but we did, I don't, you can't pick up a piece of paper and throw it in a garbage can 82 times in a row. So we felt very confident that um, that it was 100%. Over what period of time were these 80 jumps? So it took about a year and a half, the whole process, but there were six months of training. I did about 350 training jumps, but um, like I'm sure Airspeed or any of these teams that train, a lot of it is figuring out how to train. 
once you know how to train and like what moves to do, then they can rehearse the moves over and over again. But until they get the block worked out the way they want it to, that takes a lot of jumps. Then once they get it, so once I got it figured out, it was about 82, it wasn't about, it was exactly 82 times in a row um, that we were able to do it. But when this idea was first put to you, you weren't interested in being the actual guy doing it. You were very much into helping the design. Yeah, I mean, they, they asked me, they, they told me about it. Hey, why don't you jump on a plane without a parachute? And I said, you know, thanks, but no thanks. Uh, Gary Connery did it where he landed in the cardboard boxes, which yes. is unbelievably, in my opinion, one of the more underrated things that has happened in our sport, um, which I really appreciate the way he did it. He just went out and did it, right? Like, there was no talk. Just went out and did it. And I could really appreciate that. Um, mine, I needed more money and stuff, so we have a big sponsor, and that's great. But... He did that, and I was like, you know, no thanks. And they said, no, no, no parachute, no anything. And I laughed, and I said, thanks, but no thanks. I have a wife and a son, and I, I don't need to do that stuff. And then I started thinking, how could you do it? Can you do something like this? Is it possible? And then I came up with the net, and then the air cylinders, and then we started training, and here we are. But there was a big team involved, and there must have been different ideas all being put forward to stay strong and make sure you get it done your way. How was that process? So it's interesting, being part of a big team um, is an interesting dynamic, right? You trust it. I got hooked up with some great stunt coordinators, Hollywood stunt coordinators, uh, Jeff Haverstad and Jim Churchman. And Jim had this great idea with this helium bag to lift this net up was his idea, right? Um, ended up that the helium bag didn't work. But what that did by trying some other ways, what, what Jim found is that the helium bag didn't quite work, but it also disproved that you could use an airbag. Um, the airbag would have been too big, too unwieldy, would have been a lot harder of an impact. Um, and there were people voting for an airbag. And so um, we're, I was open to ideas and we looked at different options, but in the end, you kind of got to decide one and stick with it. It has to be one that you're comfortable with and being part of a large team, it's a very interesting dynamic, right? To make sure you want to keep your team members happy, but you also got to stick to what you feel is the safe and the best way to do it. On some of your practice jumps, uh, the, the low ones, the 500 foot jumps into the net, some of the first ones you were doing, did you take any hard impacts on those? Um, nope, there were no hard impacts into it, but I tell you what, it was scary jumping off a crane that was about 500 feet in the air and the net was 170 feet up and you're looking through the net, right? I mean, it looks like a screen door and you're like, is this thing really gonna stop? And you'd hop off and kind of fall on your back and land in it. And it, we got it so tuned up that you could drop a baby in there. It was so cool. Like just a nice slow stop at the bottom. And the actual day of the jump itself with this light system, I'm really very interested in this light system. It's very much like an aircraft approach with the red and the white. Tell me a bit about that. So that's one of the points I'm most proud of on the project was that that was my idea from the get go. Cause I learned that you couldn't, line up like we're so used to head up head up right all of your skydiving career it's head up head up yeah. um and when you're looking down and spotting um i, I started jumping quite a while ago so I'm, i remember when we used to have to look down me and too. spot right me too <laughs> you're looking down the side of the plane and all that but you have a reference to look straight down because you have an airplane um in the sky it's really hard to look straight down so when i was training i was finding i was opening behind the net a little bit so i came up with the lights and i said why can't i take a pappy light system just like you would have on a runway um, and basically circle the net with this Pappy light system. And then it's red on one side, it's a lens. All it is is a fine lens. So there's nothing, I'm not sending out a signal or anything. It's just a lens that's white on one side and red on the other. And the lens was such a tight tolerance that at 3000 feet, it was less than a three foot window between red and white. And it just got narrower as you got down. So we circled the net with those lights and then we moved one set about halfway in. So we're getting constant feedback on what direction to go. But what I found was interesting in the training portion was if you try to hover over something, it's like a guy shooting traditional accuracy, right? Yes. Those really long, I did a lot of that in my day. And like a, those really long finals, you start second guessing, people start moving around, you know, and they, they get antsy. Now it's turned into a lot more turn in on final short bang right on the target, which what I took that and my flying and I basically flew an approach. So as I came lower, I was stepping it in. Otherwise, if I hovered over the top, you start going like this yeah. and chasing it. So I kind of flew it down like an accuracy approach. Incredible. Was there any point in the free fall? What was it, two and a half minutes free fall, was it, Lou? Yeah, about, about something like that, 2.08 or so, till I hit the net. 
And were you confident all the way down? Did you, did you feel like you had it all the way? The, what I learned in all my practice jumps was that that initial one minute, if, to skydivers, you, you would understand. A two minute free fall is a long time. Yeah. That initial minute, as long as you're in the area, it doesn't, and I'm short of where I want to be, and I'm in the area, it's not that critical, that minute. That was that altitude that the, the press wanted, you know what I mean? The producers wanted that 25,000 foot. But that first one minute, if you're in the area, it's not that important. We can track and move. So when I jumped out, I just want to see it before I exit. I looked down, we opened the door at 0.7 short. Yeah. We'd open up the door. The guys climbed out with their smoke. Um, I looked down, I could see it. I looked back at everybody. I give them a thumbs up and I jump. And that put me out just short of the target by the time our timing. So I was just short. I have to flip. I did some transitions because I had never done that. And what's funny is I didn't plan on doing those back rolls I never thought of it before, but when I got out, you know when you get in the wind tunnel yeah. and you don't have leg straps on and you got to adjust yourself. You kick your legs to adjust your your business with normally you have leg straps holding everything up. That was something I hadn't thought of, right? When I jumped out of the plane, I had that exact feeling of getting in the wind tunnel and having to get your jumpsuit where you'd like it. Um, so I did a little flip and stuff. And then about one minute in, you really start focusing. And I never had one doubt um, that I was going to land in the net. Not I remember well. watching it, there was, I don't know, there was maybe 30 of us all watching it on a big screen. And the tension, you know, it was, people were quiet, people were, you could feel the energy in the room. What really broke the energy and got a really big laugh was the dummy pull. Yeah, I think that's great. And what, what's really funny to me, and people say, oh, everyone started, it started all these conspiracy things. And <laughs> I did the dummy pull for my community, right? No one else in the world, yeah. millions of people that watch, they have no idea what that was, right? a wave off and a practice pull. I thought like, this is an inside joke for my skydiving community, right? Like, obviously really, I don't have really it. broke the tension in the room. Yeah, and, and for me too, it was kind of like, I, I thought of it about a day before. I'm like, I gotta do something as a tip of the hat to my roots, right? Which yeah. is what we do. Yeah. So that's what that was all about. But then it started all this hate on the, I love the haters though, I love it. Cause I mean, I had, Craig Girard and Eliana and Sean Hill and Josh Hall, they were there. They saw the whole thing. There's no parachute. There's no backup. <laughs> well, every time somebody types something, it keeps it up on the algorithms. And it keeps the book <laughs> going, it? But, yeah, I, I don't care about that stuff. <laughs> before, before this project, you were involved with Felix with these uh, Stratus jumps. Yeah, that's kind of how this one came to me. So uh, I was first asked to just take photographs of Felix doing some practice jumps. And I looked at the equipment he had and I made some comments and then he almost died on one of the practice jumps by pulling handles in the wrong order. Then Felix asked me to come on and be part of the team. And basically um, I took the equipment they had and I canned it and we started over from scratch um, with Velocity Sports Equipment designing, which is Kelly is my cousin. Yeah. Um, so we, we redesigned the equipment. I trained him for the jump and that's one of my more proud things was to be able to be part of that and the team that he had around him. I mean, I went from knowing who Joe Kittinger was as a kid, being a third generation jumper, I knew who Joe was, yes. to now I'm like friends, friends with Joe. I mean, he sends my son Christmas cards and like I see him and like that's one of those relationships that I got out of that project that was, it, it's amazing to me. Every time I get to see and hang out with Joe, I learn something new. It is, there's a handful of skydivers that their names do cut through the public. People have heard of them, people know of what they're doing. When I was talking with some friends about this interview today who are not in the sport, I said, oh yeah, that guy, you're gonna speak to that guy today. So, is, is there a day goes by that you don't talk about this joke, you don't mention it? Yeah, I think it's quite a bit. And for me, it's interesting because I look at people and friends that have done amazing things like Felix, my buddy, jumped from the edge of space, it's unbelievable, right, what he did. And then I see them sharing it all the time. And I think for me, because skydiving and this is all, it's my life from before I could jump to long after, you know, um, I want this to be a thing that I did, not the thing that I did. Yes. So I try to not make, like, this is obviously maybe the, it might be the biggest thing that I do in skydiving, maybe not, I got a couple of other little things that I'm up to, but I want this to be a thing that I did, not the thing. I want people to say, oh, Luke Aikens did, all of this yes. you know and and to me what i really want is i want the whole world to understand that skydiving is as safe as you want to make it yeah I mean, you know what i mean that's it it could be as safe or as gnarly as you want to make it exactly innovation you know i think this is a recurring theme in air sports one person single-mindedly deciding 
to try something new, bring in on something new. Last week we were speaking to Richard Browning with his, uh, his Iron Man. I know Richard, you know, yeah. It, it, you, know, you, you had this idea, you had this innovation. I think that's such a good thing for people to see. You know, they, they can achieve. It doesn't have to be an extreme sport, but they can have an original idea with the right thoughts, they can bring it forward. And I think like this, the, the net jump isn't something that, you know, is a, a thing that's going to happen. People say, hey, are you going to try and top that? And I'm not going to try to top that. What do you do with a smaller net, light yourself on fire? I mean, <laughs> I, I don't know what you're going to do to do, do more than that. You're going to do different stuff. But what it did do is um, our team, the Red Bull Air Force, and other, a couple other teams have been able to get USPA, the United States Parachute Association, which I'm, a, I'm on the board of directors and then the executive committee. Um, we were able to get the board of directors to pass a waiver so that we can at demonstration jumps uh, in the right circumstances, not every time, we have a waiver to a thousand feet. So we can open our parachute more base jump style. It's still two parachutes, but kind of bring what all these people are seeing on YouTube to air shows and to, to other things. And so my jump helped crack the door for that. Like that, you know, Hey, things have changed a little bit in skydiving. The equipment is so much better and so much safer. And we're, I mean, we're able to crack that door and that's, you know, like you say, innovation. It's not like people are going to start jumping into a net, but it might lead to somebody thinking of something else. Yeah. And we're talking about events and the pandemic, COVID-19. I mean, it's been a big impact for your Red Bull Air Force with your, your, your whole program for this year. Tell us what's been happening there. So, I mean, I was on the last show. We were headed to the airport to go get on an airline and fly to San Antonio to do an air show in Texas. Um, and on the way to the airport, the pandemic pandemic was going, and I was thinking, you know, we were all talking, do we get on a plane? Do we not get on a plane? And on the way to the airport, the air show canceled. And so that directly affects the income and stuff, not only for our skydivers, but all the air show pilots, the people that are out there promoting aviation to the general public, right? Like, I love the barnstorming days from back then. I wish I was, sometimes I wish I was born back then, not for the landings, because their landings <laughs> sucked, but the... The, just the whole attitude and the go get the them crowds, and nothing's the impossible. Yeah, they, the yeah. crowds and like all of that stuff. So I really enjoy the air show circuit. So all of that stuff just stopped. I mean, we're down here, we're doing a little bit of work with the military down here right now, but all of those things, everybody's just on hold in, in the world. And um, I'm working on a project with David Blaine, the magician. Yes. Uh, I'm project managing with him. He's doing this really cool project. and. We're hoping to, it has some skydiving in it, you know, hopefully, and we're trying to uh, give it a little distraction, like a fun distraction to the world, but keep it in our world of aviation and keep people looking up to the skies and trying to have some fun. Uh, we look, we look, really look forward to that. Tell me a, a bit about some of the things you've done, Luke. You don't want to be remembered as just the guy who did the no parachute jump. Tell me about some of the things you, you've done, like you're, you're very proud of yourself in, in your career. Yeah, I mean, like from being an airline pilot, or not, like, excuse me, not airline pilot, but being a commercial pilot, airplanes, helicopters, uh, 20,000 jumps, I'm an AFF instructor, examiner, um, any one of those things, it makes one person like that, that's what they did in their life, right? Which is very cool. I'm trying to stack this, this giant deck up to be able to say that from Hollywood stunts, you know, from doing the stunts to being a stunt coordinator in some, some of the movie gigs, to uh, helping Red Bull Aces, the wingsuit race. Yes. You know, we're working on bringing that back. Excellent. But bringing what they're doing in the mountains, this amazing stuff, the videos in the mountains are unbelievable, but it's also very dangerous, right? So I did Red Bull Aces, I came up with that, where we take that same cool energy of racing and add the head-to-head -head part, and we put it up at safe altitudes with cypresses and AADs and normal parachute opening altitudes and, you know, trying to just bring more eyes to the world of skydiving, you know, through whether it's Felix's jump or my next project that I'm working on right now. I want people to say that Luke Gakins helped bring skydiving to the public so they can see it and see, you know, what's possible. That That's what I'm trying to do. No, you're certainly doing it. You really are, Luke. You really have opened the eyes of the general public to what we do in our very niche part of aviation. We're, we're very yeah, it's kind of interesting when you said that, I started thinking what else is cool. You know, I was on the U.S. paraski team, like the skiing and para yeah. accuracy team. Um, and I was on that team with myself, my cousin Andy Farrington, his sister Carrie Farrington, my other cousin, and my brother Nick Akins. We were the U.S. paraski team, like the A team, like the varsity paraski team one year. 
and things like that are just like cool, fun family, you know? A lot of people's parents took them out hunting or sports or whatever, and our family was skydiving, and that's, you know, what keeps us together. I saw a picture of your, um, some big way, some belly big way with everybody on it was in your family, from your grandma. Yeah, we had some, some big ones like that, you know, and the only, also the, the only, not the only thing, but the only record in skydiving that I really want to be a part of that I haven't done yet um, is I haven't done a free fly world record, believe it or not. So I've done a crew world records, I've done belly world records, and I really want to be, I don't know that there's somebody who's done all three of those disciplines right. yet. It's close, uh, yeah. but I don't know of anybody that has done um, all three of them, and that would be cool. In my head, but uh, I can't think of anybody just yet. So, and with your the Red Bull team, have you got events now that are still in place for 2020? Man, we're they're planning 2021 right now. Yeah. Um, every time, like we, there was two or three days of like, wow, things are going to start. We're starting to plan stuff out, um, and and then um, all the the rest of the stuff happened with the protests and. You know, there's more important things out there for the world to worry about than me being able to go out and demonstrate skydive, you know? So we're trying to, you know, take a breath and pause appropriately for, for what needs to happen and then be primed and ready to pounce when it's time to uh, get back to business. I will look forward to seeing your team back out there with some of those incredible demonstration jumps around the world with the rest of the guys as well. But thanks very much for your time, Luke. It's been a pleasure to have this chat with you here on Xbox News. No worries, love it.